father to share uh, in his uh, sovereignty uh, with the world. And uh, in the transition, Luke helps us to see that uh, the disciples are in a transition to learning that Christ's presence on earth now, rather than being contained in Jesus' own physical body, is now to be shared with all believers around the world simultaneously through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that he promised. And what we see now is God fulfilling that promise and Jesus uh, empowering us uh, through the gift of the Spirit, which happened at Pentecost, 50 days after Christ's resurrection. Now, this is uh, a good study this whole book of Acts is the study of how the, whole, how the disciples learned to live by the Spirit and the result in spreading the gospel in their known world. This challenges us, particularly as Presbyterians, in our understanding, because we don't really uh, focus that much on the Holy Spirit. It is something that we uh, pronounce in our creeds, but uh, you know, not, not necessarily something that is an everyday encounter. That's because we in our culture, our tribe as Presbyterians, everything is filtered through our brains. We believe in a reason that a rational faith and in comes the Holy Spirit. And it's taken the Presbyterians a little while to uh, adapt uh, to the power of the Holy Spirit because we've been uh, slow to experience or even promote the work of the Spirit in our lives because we didn't totally understand it. And we were afraid that if the Holy Spirit took over, uh, we would be swinging from the chandeliers and uh, doing, doing various other uh, sundry things that uh, we don't know. Perhaps that's why Presbyterians had just learned how to clap 10 years ago. Uh, because we're afraid of showing emotion. So uh, here along comes the Holy Spirit that frees us to be the people of God, to be Christ's presence on earth in and through us. So there is an agnosticism, uh, that means without knowledge, about the Holy Spirit in the church today. And most people would say, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? And most people would have to be candidly say, I'm not sure, except that the Holy Spirit is part and parcel of what it means uh, to be a Christian. And uh, there is a quest in the church today to be plugged in to a power greater than ourselves. Um, people are in the need of intimacy and inspiration. Um, people are in the need of an impelling power of the Holy Spirit and to uh, get in touch with the promise that, that Jesus gave to everybody. And what we learn through the study in Acts is that it is impossible to live the Christian life without the indwelling spirit. Um, courageous discipleship is a crisis of, in the crisis of society cannot be accomplished without the uh, guidance and the enabling energy of a supernatural power, which God provides for us through the Holy Spirit. So at Pentecost, God provided what is needed to empower in, and his discouraged disciples, okay? 120 um, frightened, impotent, impotent, excuse me, uh, self-centered, willful, discouraged men and women were transformed into new creatures. And this is the underlying truth about Pentecost. The one through whom all things were created, the eternal Logos, which uh, came to be to uh, recreate humankind, uh, God promised through Jesus and now through the Holy Spirit. That's what happened at Pentecost. God's Spirit generated the spirits of people and produced a potential beyond human limitations. What Jesus incarnated in his earthly ministry and promised was giving to his followers and that's what we have in Pentecost. So the final hours before Pentecost were filled with anxious frustration, the impossibility of living Christ's message and emulating his life. Sounds like today, doesn't it? How could this happen without Jesus' physical presence? Though he had clearly said that he would come and make his home in them, they had not realized what that meant. They were to be 
women and men in Christ, and he would dwell in them. This is the same edge of expectation that we will find in so many of our churches today. Our task as disciples of Christ, then, is to join them and be ready for the supernatural endowment of power. So let's read uh, the scriptures in Acts chapter 2, the first 13 verses, and uh, listen to uh, Luke's uh, recount of the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and the tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and this sound at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. May God bless to our understanding this reading of God's word. So let's talk about the dynamics of Pentecost. The dynamics of Pentecost were wind, fire, and praise. Suddenly from heaven in verse two, there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind. Now the Hebrew word for spirit and wind is ruach. The wind had been re representation of the spirit for the Hebrew people throughout the generations. Um, and according to Ezekiel chapter 37, when the Lord spoke to Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones, he told them to prophesy to the breath, prophecy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Now, the dry bones in that passage symbolize the defeated, dejected people of Israel in exile in, in Ezekiel's day. Much of the feeling that the disciples must have entertained when Jesus was no longer with them. He was saying like, wow, how could we be disciples without Jesus? They needed the spirit for life to come into them again in Ezekiel as in the day of Pentecost. Jesus used the image of the wind of the Spirit when he said to Nicodemus, if you remember that story, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot, I, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That's John 3, verses 7 and 8. Now, as the Lord instructed the disciples, were waiting for the Lord to give outward signs of his tangible presence to them and to help them understand what Jesus was asking them to do and to be. Imagine this, they're all huddled together in a house, in a room with the shades down, the doors closed for fear. Okay, this is the context of the Lord giving to them the Holy Spirit. Now the Lord provided an encounter with a violent wind that became an inward experience that changed their thoughts, their emotions, and their will. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit working through us and outward to the world in which we live. Now the disciples experienced something outside of themselves that changed their behavior. This shows that we live in a spiritual world and God's presence comes to us outside ourselves and invests 
the Spirit's presence in and through us. God's power comes from outside ourselves to the Spirit, who then works with our spirit, our own natures and gifts and talents, who then works with our spirit to change our attitudes, our wills, and our emotions. Now, uh, today's culture teaches that if we want to change our attitudes, our wills, and our emotions, we must work hard to change ourselves from inside us by our own efforts. This runs contrary to the biblical image that we're getting at Pentecost, for the power of God comes outside of us to take up residence within us, and then the transformation process happens, not by our efforts, but by the Holy Spirit working in and through us. The Lord's people were being stirred up, quickened, and brought back to life because the Spirit had come. And a, one of the witnesses, the Scripture tells us, divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. The second dynamic was equally an outward sign of what was happening with them. Now, fire in the Old Testament, i.e. the burning bush or the pillar of fire when they were walking in the wilderness, etc., is seen as a manifestation of God or of God's glory. So this is not an unknown encounter with God, a manifestation of God for those who were Jews in their life and their faith. And at Pentecost, John the Baptist's prophecy was being enacted. Remember when John the Baptist say, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So we're seeing at Pentecost an enactment of this prophecy. John explained that this new fire from heaven, what it would do, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the weed into his barn, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. What sounds like a fierce purging is also a great promise of the work of the Holy Spirit in and through us. The Spirit's fire burns out the shaft in those who have survived the winnowing fan's test. The weed of the Lord, the disciples, have shaft in their minds and their hearts, which the Spirit burns away. You see, we come to Christ as new Christians with old habit patterns, all lifestyles, broken relationships, ways in which our sin has taken over us. And part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to purge those old ways of living. Okay? The statement was given in context of his judgment. Now, the gift of the Holy Spirit is that also he burns out anything in us which could cripple us in his service. His spirit is given for the continuation of his ministry. You see, we need to understand that we are people in process, and the work of the Holy Spirit is to help us understand that we're not completed yet. So if you feel frustrated because you are a Christian, because things aren't going like you would like them to happen now that you are a Christian, it's a reminder that you need the Holy Spirit. You need to apply the Spirit's presence in the very issues that you are frustrated. Uh, you find yourself in a frustrating mode. Um, now this sometimes runs contrary of what we believe uh, should happen in our lives when we become a Christian. Uh, we, we sing about peace and comfort of the Holy Spirit, but huh, how our words have drifted from the original meaning here. Uh, peace is what he gives after the reconciliation and a surrendered will. The peace comes when we submit to what God wants to do in and through us. The word arene, which means harmonious relationships between God and us, and also between us and others, is the word for peace. And the shaft of anything which separates us from God or any other person is burned away by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Spirit is doing in and through us to sure up our relationship to God and our relationship with each other. And comfort means much more than just fortifying our anxious hearts. 
Uh, paraclesis is a combination of the word para beside and cleo, uh, cleo, which calls one to one side. And this is what Jesus said when he was with his disciples in the upper room the last time of his day of his earthly ministry with them. He says, I need to go and be with the Father, which we experienced last week in the ascension, and I will send you another, a paraclete, one who will come alongside you and will bring to mind everything that I taught you in new power, and that is where we are at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. Now, paraclesis also means to exhort. When the Spirit comes to us, he is champion and friend in life's challenges, but he loves so much that he burns away what will debilitate us or to prevent us fully from becoming the persons we were meant to be. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in and through us as Christians today. More than burning away, the Spirit refines and galvanizes, makes us, gives us courage to stand our ground as Christians. The dross is burned off and the pure metal is left. What a great promise. We don't have to stay the way we are. Uh, you know, you hear a lot of people say, uh, Jesus loves you uh, the way that you are when you first come to Christianity, which is true. But God loves you even more not to leave you in the state in which you entered into the Christian experience, but to continue to work in and through us so that we can understand the fullness of the salvation that is offered in the cross and in Jesus Christ. Now, the indwelling spirit makes us like himself. Uh, we have a character transplant. We're not what we used to be, nor are we what we will be. That is the work of the spirit. Now, the visual evidence of fire above the heads of the people was another outward sign that became an inner reality. The, the spirit never bypasses our humanity. He transforms it and then flows through it. So we as Presbyterians don't need to fear the presence of the Holy Spirit in and through our lives that the Holy Spirit is going to cause us to do something that we don't want to do. It's not Holy Spirit does not force us into any place or anything that we don't want to go or don't want to be. Our calling as Christians is to align ourselves with God, and the aid of the Holy Spirit helps us to see what God wants in any situation and any circumstance. But if we don't want to go there, the Holy Spirit is not going to force us to go. We, have, we get to choose whether or not we want to trust the Holy Spirit's power and courage and faith and, and, and to move into it. So uh, we, we're, we're giving that opportunity um, the Spirit by, does not bypass our humanity. He transforms it and flows through it. This is an important point. Uh, they were free now, the disciples, to love each other, and we shall see they were given an unquenchable love for the people in the world. Part of that transformation is not only to say, wow, I am so blessed by God, I'm so thankful for what God is doing in my life, but part of the presence of the Holy Spirit is to say, man, I can't help but not share that with other people. The miracle of Pentecost, uh, the Pentecostal fire, it later produced the ability to love the Lord and others. This is the evidence of the work of the Spirit working in and through us. Now, prior to the experience of Pentecost and the infilling of the Spirit, the disciples were incapable of profound love. The closest we have is people, Peter's verbal expression of friendship when Jesus went to him and said, Peter, do you love me? And he had to be asked outright for that. Peter, do you love me? The Greek word there is translated, Peter, do you agape me? Agape means giving, forgiving, unqualified love expressed in consistent, constant, unreserved self-giving. That's the definition of agape. It is not dependent on the adequacy or the performance of the recipient. This, in other words, we love people not because of what they do for us, but because God placed them in a relationship with us. This word is used to describe God's nature, God's love for the world, God's love for his son, and those who believe in Christ in John 14, 
and the attitude that Jesus wants his people to have toward one another and the world, a very powerful understanding of the word agape. So many of us are troubled about the inability to express either of the two qualities of love. Um, when Peter was asked, Jesus said, do you agape me? Peter walked back and eventually said, I filio you. I have a friendship love. I don't have a sacrificial love yet. Um, our problems with impatience, with people, difficulties in forgiving and forgetting and reluctance to give ourselves away freely to others. Um, this is a constant, a constant contradiction of our faith in Christ as their Savior. And the Holy Spirit comes to open us up so that the same love that Jesus offered to the world, agape love, we can offer to others. And many of us feel uh, defeated and frustrated, and the tender friendship of filio comes with real effort, and agapeo, which is the, uh, the, the verb for agape, hardly at all, hardly comes at all. Now, the shocking discovery is that Christ's quality of love is inseparable from Christ because this is Christ's nature. He is agape, and agape cannot be fully experienced apart from his spirit residing in us. Now, this is important to understand because we cannot share agape with a love until, with others until we understand the agape love that Christ offers us and his, and his death on the cross and his resurrection. And that's an important reality that is part and parcel of what it means to be a Christian. So we talked about wind and we talked about fire. Now let's talk about all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. The third manifestation at Pentecost, okay, was for the 120 disciples who were there, okay, and the crowds that they had gathered in Jerusalem for the celebration of Pentecost. You see, at Pentecost, all the Jews came to Jerusalem from all around the known world, okay? So this is, this is a very powerful miracle that God was given to allow the Holy Spirit to be seen and manifested in the lives of the disciples and for them to see the power of the Holy Spirit with that they would have to draw from in their ministry in the days and years to come. The followers of Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit for praise and proclamation. The two go together, by the way. The Spirit releases us to praise, and the praise becomes an effective proclamation. The followers of the Lord were given unction for utterance, and they were experienced communion with the Holy Spirit for communication. The Spirit and his gifts are for ministry. Underline that. That's important to understand. The Spirit had filled the room, and now the Spirit filled the ready disciples and followers whose preparation had made room for him in them. And um, they were filled to the full. That's the Greek word there. The result was that they were Spirit-filled as, as a vessel is filled. To be filled to the full, as the Greek implies, means that the Spirit invaded every facet, function, and facility of their nature. As human beings, they had minds, will, and emotions, and physical bodies. The entry of the Holy Spirit was through their spirits, their conscious self. Their minds were captured by the truth of the Spirit, their brains thought it out, and their nervous system channeled it with every part of their body responding in unity and oneness quite a day. Praise was undeniable evidence. Most of us understand that to a greater or lesser degree when we're in a worship service and we love the music, we love the message, and all of a sudden we feel God's presence and it brings forth from us an elated spirit where we're going, oh my gosh, I can't believe how good God is. And our natural inclination is to share that with our neighbors and the people that we went through. He said, did you feel that? Did you hear that? Did you experience that? This is what is happening on the day of Pentecost. One of the manifestations of this is that they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Galileans, whose language is Aramaic, were able to speak in Latin, Greek, and other languages. 
represented by the people gathered from around the then known world. These were languages that they were not taught in school or taught at home, that God just blessed them so that the rest of the world could understand what God was doing. The praise of the spirit-filled believers was spoken in the languages of the people gathered in Jerusalem. Pentecost shows that Christianity is multinational. The gospel speaks to all cultures and nationalities. On Pentecost, for 120 to speak in the language of different nationalities was a miracle for the communication of what was happening in and through them. They gathered disciples were ecstatic with praise. They fearless joy. In fact, the people said they're drunk. They were drunk with praise. Uncontrollable enthusiasm and joy was a part of their life that those who were witnessing it said they must be drunk. They both thought and felt uncontainable adoration. And the evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit is freedom from self-concern and to spirit consciousness. When the Holy Spirit is working through us, we are courageous, we are bold, we, and it's evidence in how we embrace our situation and the people around us. We are released to praise God with unfettered joy and gratitude as a sign of the Spirit at work within us. The motivation for this in the upper room was based on several definite experiences. The believers felt blessed and cherished as the Lord's beloved. A recipient of what God had promised became a reality, and they felt blessed, like, wow, God was true to what Jesus said God would do. He had been faithful to his promise to return to them. He was not only resurrected from the dead, he was with and in them now through the presence of the Holy Spirit. The rushing wind communicated its power, and the fire set their minds and hearts ablaze. Now later, in the development of the fellowship of the, of the church, the Holy Spirit gave the gift of utterance, which is not a specific language. Words and sounds were given by the Spirit to release the believers for praise beyond the capacity of expression in their own words, their own languages, and for prophecies to the church. When the gift was used in the assembly of believers, the Spirit also gave the gift of interpretation so that the words spoken could be interpreted for the edification of the church. You can read all about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which Paul explains uh, the gift of tongues uh, to the church as an ecstatic utterance. This extra natural in that a person cannot produce the gift, but can be cooperative agent for it to happen. Uh, this is important understanding. Again, the Holy Spirit doesn't take us over and controls us, but when the Holy Spirit falls and gives us the gift of tongues, we still have to move our lips. This is a legitimate New Testament gift, which is given by the Spirit to a believer for praise in his or her own prayers, as well as in the church when instruction of its proper use is given and the gift of interpretation is also utilized. The other tongues, the languages of Pentecost and the gift of tongues was that it later proved, provided, excuse me, to the believers they have this in common. They both require a spirit-filled yieldedness for a speech system to function. So when we are in our natural state, without the Holy Spirit, we see other people. But with the gift of the Holy Spirit, we see people who need Christ. Okay? And uh, a yieldedness is for us to do something with that urging of the Holy Spirit, to go over, befriend them, walk alongside them until they become disciples. It is helpful to think of what happened on Pentecost as a miracle, and later what happened to believers is a gift. Act of praise, uh, praising the Lord for what he does and has done and frees us to receive is what, uh, what he will do in and through us. Uh, praise is the ultimate level of human relinquishment to the Spirit of the Lord. And praising enables endurance, determination, courage, and openness to the future. Disciples are not just a jolly, carefree band of believers before, before Pentecost. They weren't. They were hidden. They were discouraged. They were afraid. They had personal problems, relational difficulties. On a hostile world, 
to face without much confidence, but tell the Holy Spirit hit them. And the rest of Acts, we're going to see this working out through the lives of the believers. We are not told that praise was a part of their prayers before Pentecost, but we are told repeatedly that it was an important part of their prayers afterwards. And we live today as recipients of the secret they discovered. The same Holy Spirit who produced unfettered praise in them is the source of our ability to praise in difficult times. The Spirit releases his blessings to us when we praise in advance of a resolution. That's all the time that we have this morning. I invite you to read the rest in your notes. But this is an important event that happened in the life of the church at Pentecost. And I pray that you will yield to a gift that has been given to you by Christ for your empowerment to live on earth that galvanizes your faith, that sets you ablaze, that is a wind that comes from outside us that we can experience as part of our life and our faith. May that be our experience. Remember that in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, you cannot say Jesus is Lord without the presence of the Holy Spirit. So if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit. Our task is to learn to live by listening to the Spirit's work in and through us. Let us pray. Uh, gracious God, this is a powerful teaching of which we spend a lifetime uncovering. We're thankful that as we continue our journey through Acts, we will see the disciple embrace this new reality. May they encourage us in their life and faith to live in our world with the same experience. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, Randy, thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Randy.